Okay, well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're a little bit after 1300 Pacific time. Uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel Brett Lee. With, I'm the uh, Deputy Director with OCPA LA. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our second Joe Talk. Uh, we're very excited about this one uh, and, and very honored to have two uh, very esteemed guests with us to talk about uh, a very important issue uh, in the Army and in the country. Um, but first, want to just for those who have not been here before, just talk about what uh, what Joe Talks are about. Uh, this is a, a brand new initiative we just started to have a direct engagement virtually uh, with entertainment professionals out here uh, in LA with Army senior leaders and subject matter experts to inform the entertainment industry about Army initiatives programs, the men and women who serve in, in uniform. Uh, but also to inspire you all to, to tell our story. Um, so, uh, you know, we created this initiative to to uh, to bring everybody together, even though it is in a virtual space. Um, and so far, we're we're thrilled with uh, with the direction it's going. Uh, and, and this uh, next topic is a great example of that. Uh, so, we're very honored to have Mr. Anselm Beach, who is the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army. Uh, for the Equity and Inclusion Agency. Uh, he has a, a very long esteemed career working primarily in, in diversity and equity, uh, equal employment uh, opportunities within the Army, the uh, Veterans Affairs uh, Administration, uh, and Homeland Security. Uh, he's a proud graduate of George Tech, I assume. And uh, <laughs> and uh, it was also a White House fellow. So he is uh, intimately involved with all issues in the Army involving uh, greater diversity and equity uh, within our organization. We also have Lieutenant General Gary Brito, who is currently the Assistant Chief of Staff of the Army for Personnel, uh, otherwise known as the G1. Uh, he is a 1987 graduate of Penn State, uh, Nitton Lions, go sir, and, uh, and uh, was former the, formerly the Commanding General of the Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning. Prior to that, he was Commanding General at the Joint Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk. And prior to that was the Deputy Commanding General at uh, 25th Infantry in Hawaii, among many, many other jobs that he is that he has held. So for the uh, for this session, I would ask that if anybody wants to uh, ask a question once the initial comments are made, uh, please put them in the chat feature. Uh, we'll be able to see that, and we'd love to get your uh, your questions. I think this is going to be a, a very lively topic. It's relevant to the Army and the country as, whole, as a whole, uh, but of course it's relevant to uh, to entertainment industry on a daily basis that you know that want to convey a representation of the whole country in their products. So with that, I will pass it over to uh, to DC. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, Brett. Thank you, and the entire team. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to spend some virtual time with you today. We can, we can probably all agree, uh, if nothing else that COVID has afforded us is the opportunity to keep moving on, even though through, through the rest of the means, and I know we're definitely in, in different time zones as well. And I really genuinely want to thank everybody, and Lee and the entire team, uh, for, for your interest in our soldiers in, in the military. I had a commander a few years ago who shared, you know, any opportunity you have to nest with the community and the public to learn more about the soldiers in our army is always a good thing. And if nothing else, because our army in a military and a larger context is represents uh, soldiers of all nationalities, creeds, religions from all the 50 states and territories, very fiber that makes up this country, which, which is great. And I'm sure you can tell them I'm highly motivated and, and, and glad to be serving still. Uh, it's been well over 30 years and, and definitely uh, look forward to some discussion with you today. Uh, also proud to be part of a, a great team that just really cares about what we do for our nation and the military. And, and it is very, very sincere, passionate, and dedicated uh, on providing an army and a military that is very diverse, strong, committed to the values, and just represent, my words, all that's great about America and this great country that we have. Uh, I'm not recruiting anybody, but if you do want to join, I'll be, be happy to give you the oath. But it's, it's something that the military takes near and dear with the, with the soldiers that we, we work with of all ranks, uh, the personnel policies that have existed and will exist in the future, 
We'll talk about our, our, our people's strategy, public strategy later on. But I would also extend that that same care is not only just for the soldiers of all ranks, from, from private on to general, but the over 30,000 civilians, the Department of the Army civilians that support, support the Army as well. Clearly one big team. And all of that is focused on total Army. Uh, that active duty, uh, National Guard, and the Reserve, which make over over one million of them, you know, men, men and women who have decided to join. Mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, the importance of being nested with the community, and, and that brings me back to the, to the gratitude I give to this effort and understanding the Army. And, you know, we, we have a, an informal handshake, or formal handshake, with the moms and dads across the nation and the family members mm -hmm. That, that'll, that support their sons and daughters to join. And you know, some of my team may be tired of hearing about that, but it, it, it's key that we look at it that way, which gives an urgency and, a, and an importance to the personnel policies that we have uh, in, in, in representing a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment for all those soldiers that decide to join, whether it's from the cities of New York or the farmlands of Kansas, and, and that's key. Now, to get a little, little Army geeky ease, I guess, uh, we do have a, a, and have for some time, actually this past January was a, a one year that we, we've inked and, and formalized our Army people strategy. I won't go into some of the details perhaps in the Q&A, but it, uh, question and answer, but it is very much focused along some, some lines of effort, some energy on, on taking care of our people. And not just the uniformed of all ranks, but the civilians as well everywhere on how you recruit, how you employ, how you train, how you assess, how you retain, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, private that joins today will continue to re-enlist, re-enlist, and he's a sergeant major of the future. Or having policies that are equitable to, to give opportunity for all those who just want to continue to excel within their God-given potential, coupled with the training and opportunities that will give him or her as well. And I would extend the same to our civilians. And, and Mr. Beach, to my right, your left here, has been integral in what I'll call some very fresh focus on the diversity policies that, that help us with our diversity, equity, inclusion for the Army as well, which has always been important, not just the last year or two, but it's always been important. You can take it back a couple of decades, um, but the Army has taken action to be ahead of any societal issues and just offer equity, opportunity for all those who are qualified to join, to stand up and join, and have potential to grow. Uh, I could babble all day, but to, to formalize it, you know, we do have some lines of effort in our, in our people strategy, but it's about giving the best opportunity, training, enforcement of our values that will leverage the, the, the benefits that have come out of a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment for any soldier, any officer or non-commissioned officer that wants to join and give them opportunities to reach his or her fullest potential. Uh, so with that, you know, we, we, you don't just grow a general, you don't just grow a sergeant major. They come in and we will give them an opportunity to be the best they can be. And with that, I'd like to share some stage time with my battle buddy here, Mr. Beach. Uh, so thank you, sir. And uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, obviously, uh, um, I wish I could be out there with you. As a matter of fact, I told Brett that next time we're doing this, uh, please, I would love to be out in California. Um, so, you know, I, I'd just like to underscore some of what uh, General Brito just said. And, um, you know, if you hear an accent in my voice, it's not just my DC accent. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was born in the Caribbean and uh, growing up, if somebody told me that one day I would move to the United States and I would actually join the world's greatest army and then uh, transition from there and be a senior executive within the army, I would probably be laughing or I'd be, I'd be you know, laughing because, um, you know, that wasn't kind of, that would not have been one of those things that I imagined. And I share that with you because um, this is really the crux of what we get to within the army. We get people from all, uh, all uh, calls of life. And, and you probably look at me and you would see General Brito, Brito and he has a great uniform and a lot of badges and everything else, and I'm sitting next to him as a civilian. And it really gets to, um, you know, that kind of juxtaposition 
because of the total army enterprise is comprised both of arm of, of, of soldiers and civilians. And 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 and, and we need that um, to ensure that we could fight and win the nation's wars. So as we talk about diversity uh, and, and we talk about army people's strategy, um, and, and as the nation wrestles with this notion of diversity, I, I would I would say that the army has been doing um, diversity before diversity was cool. So we have always led in that kind of social change construct, you know, going, you know, going back in history, uh, integration of schools, integration of, arm, of, of, of the army, um, um, racial integration, gender integration, they are all those different things. As a matter of fact, um, you know, getting to this whole notion of diversity, um, the army started, the Department of Defense started uh, the DRY, which is Defense Race Relations Institute, it has since then become the, become the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute. And that is where I actually went to school when I was in the uniform to become an uh, Equal Opportunity Advisor, to really learn about this whole notion of people. So, um, you know, this was a few years back. And at that time, when I, when I, when I was a graduate of, of that institute and still in the uniform, there was really no chief diversity officer positions around. So, uh, so again, this was kind of one of those foundational constructs that uh, that that was occurring uh, within the military and had not really taken root within the private sector and the civilian uh, sector uh, at that time. And and just to add a little bit more, as uh, General Brito talked about the the Army People's Strategy, which is the foundational document, I, I want to let you know that what we are doing in the Army right now is really shifting the paradigm uh, on on diversity. So while a lot of people are focused on representation, we are moving beyond representation to, to participation. So it's one thing to get people, um, you know, the one of each, um, which is the, the, kind, the, kind, the kind of uh, common nomenclature for diversity. People say, well, there's not enough diversity, meaning they did not see the one of each in the room. But in the Army, as we talk about that, we talk about beyond representation and the value construct uh, in, in, in creating cohesive teams and optimizing talent. So, um, so as, as, as the nation is, is, is wrestling with this, in the Army, we are having a very different conversation, changing the paradigm of diversity. And, 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 and we see diversity as an end state, and we get there when we leverage uh, equity and inclusion. So um, having said that, I, I, would, I, I, I am glad that to, to be a part of this conversation this afternoon, as we talk about, you know, this 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 uh, this very um, relevant uh, issue of diversity with, within the army and the nation. Thank you. And Brett, if if, if you allow me, um, I, I reference opportunities that the military gets, and, and I like to just share one story. And I'll, I'll protect the soldier and not mention his name where he came from. I'll give the truncated version of it. But exactly, well, 21 years ago this year. Um, young Major Brito, I had an opportunity to link up with a lieutenant, and I was his first assignment as an officer. And about a month ago, I promoted then lieutenant to the rank of colonel, 06, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, for those who don't know anything about the military, it's, it's a pretty big deal. But what's, what, what was bigger to me was his life story. Uh, a young man on the streets of Los Angeles, a high school dropout who sought the attention of a recruiter, I'm a recruiter. And that recruiter opened the door, an opportunity for him to get his GED and graduate high school. So he did, through the recruiter, went a, re a program to get his GED, an opportunity. Uh, served for about 10 years as an enlisted soldier, went to officer candidate school, and that's when we met, and recently promoted him to the colonel. And went from a GED to working on his PhD now because of some opportunities that the military gave. So I'm not offering that up as a recruiting poster, but I am offering it up as an institution, an enterprise that sees the talents of individuals and how they can contribute to the bigger enterprise and gave some opportunities in this case. And whether you want to call it diversity, inclusion, and equity, I would say all three, but an institution that just gave an opportunity for someone to reach his or her, in this case, his fullest potential. There's probably more to come. And something I'm just personally very, very happy to be proud of. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the team, I guess. Yeah, thank uh, you, sir, for 
sharing that that story. Um, uh, you know, I, I taught history before at West Point, so I'm going to reserve my uh, my interest in, in talking a deep story about Army history. However, just to give some of the highlights, and Mr. Beach talked about this the other day, you know, that, that the Army's been doing diversity for a long time, um, and, and certainly we haven't always gotten it right, but we... If you look at the historical record, we've always bent towards the, the arc of social justice and, and towards the direction of, of inclusivity and, and, uh, and diversity, diversity, excuse me. Going all the way back to the, the enlistment of African American troops in the Civil War, um, the opportunities that were afforded not just to African Americans, but to immigrants between the Civil War all the way up to World War II, and of course with the the, the you know, the great stories of like the Harlem Hellfighters during World War II, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, what you had come out of World War II was uh, an understanding that, uh, that there was value in diversity within the ranks. And of course, President Truman uh, ends desegregation in 1948, uh, which doesn't end, you know, the diversity issue. Obviously, we're still talking about this today. But what you have are mileposts along the way. Uh, with the, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the repeal of the transgender ban, uh, the, the opening up of combat roles to women um, over a period of, of a couple of uh, decades. So now you have an army that is, um, it looks more like the rest of the country. Um, from a personal standpoint, and this is not to age either one of you gentlemen, um, but you, you were there uh, sometime in the 1980s, maybe. I don't want to say how how long back. But uh, what is your personal experience as you've seen the Army deal with issues of inclusivity and and diversity over the last 30 to 40 years? Certainly. Yeah, I that first. Hey, Brett, I and uh, I'm going to take it from 1987 to almost present. <laughs> 1987 started off my career at the infantry school as an infantry officer at Fort Benning, Georgia. Six months ago, moved from the Maneuver Center of Excellence, Fort Benning, Georgia, here to the Pentagon. Uh, and here's the context. Uh, when I started, the infantry was all male. Okay? And at a time, I would say a few minorities serving in the infantry as well. So if you just take the gender and the the, the the racial category aspect, that was the dynamics of the infantry at that time. Fast forward over time, I also happened to be associated with it when the combat arms specialties were open to women. It was also around when one of our, what was an all male school, ranger school, open to women as well. Happened to be what I'll call blessed and fortunate to command the Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning, which is now armor and infantry up to six months ago. So to see the, the, the evolution of those two combat arms branches open more broadly to all nationalities, male and female, who met, who wanted to serve, had the talent to serve, and met the standards to serve, are excelling in both of those branches. The same with Ranger School, which is over 40, 50 years old, which up until about uh, I think it was 10 years ago, I may be off on the math, was male only because the infantry only, were, well, combat arms are going. And now we're close to about 100 females that have graduated. So it's just a great um, open door for those who are qualified and have the desire to serve and reach their full potential. And that small respective branch. So I'm just giving you a small snapshot of what I've seen over my 30 plus years. And also, uh, seeing more soldiers uh, move to grow to the leadership ranks from either private to sergeant major or lieutenant, less to be three-star general as well, that may be in a minority category, in this case, of course, I am, go, go through those ranks also. So I have seen the seriousness in both policies, and not wavering on the standards, but policies and opportunities for those who qualify to serve to do just that. And the, the audio was serious. The audio matched the video and the integration of the combat arms for all those all women who want to, and the same opportunities for black, white, Chinese, Asian, Native American, Latino that want to serve as well. It's, I won't say it's taken over 30 years, but it's evolved quickly. And the audio and the video and the actions of our senior leaders is serious for just that. Did that get to your question a bit? 
Yeah, absolutely, sir. And you actually are hitting on something that that really is sort of the next phase, I think. And, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. And this is, you know, having been at West Point previously and talked to people who were trying, you know, trying their best to in, to have a greater enrollment of women, greater enrollment of, of minorities at West Point. Um, and and it's not that easy, you know, just opening up the gates and saying, come on in. It, so what we bump up against is not that these positions, jobs, roles, uh, organizations are not open to to other to, to women or to uh, other ethnic minorities. Is that we're having trouble getting them to go through the gate? Is that what you see? Is your next challenge is is the encouragement that they should come to these places that previously did not accurately reflect reflect the rest of the country? If if I may, I'd like to answer some of that and then. Uh phone a friend sitting next to me as well. In the very beginning, I mentioned our people strategy is very embedded on recruitment assessments and that as well. I'll give one small example. Our, just our recruiting command and our, for in layman's terms, what are our branch commandants that represent the respective branches have, have gone out recruiting across the entire nation, certain high schools and, and cities and countries as well explaining the, here's what the branches are, here's the opportunities that you have. Offering what might not have been uh, an educational forum to say Latino or women or anybody, say, hey, these opportunities are here. Uh, last commissioning year, uh, specifically, there were more, a, a more African-American female going to the United States Mil Military Academy than ever before. Same for some minorities and, and other genders coming into the combat arms branches than ever before. And then part of that is just education and showing what the opportunities are, and you make the respective choice. And for our listed soldiers, broadly the same. There's 115 specialties that you can come into the Army, maybe off of one or two. And you can get a license on some of those. You can get certified on some of those. Again, touch into that opportunity. Um, I'd like to pull my battle buddy here, can expand on it a bit more on the people strategy and the annexes. Uh, uh, absolutely. So um, I think if I were to uh, kind of contextualize that a little bit, um, what I would say is that, um, you, you know, there was the previous notion that diversity um, was just kind of the representation. So we were working to get to that representation. So as we, as we talked about, you know, how many of each, like how many people were represented in the infantry or how many, how many in the minority community or at West Point, you know, that was kind of like that thing that we were trying to get to. And, and, and you talked a little bit about, you know, what would be the next stage. So as we started getting, as we started working on that representation side, the next thing that we had to drive to would have been that participation. So we get people from not just being represented, but now they're actually participation participating. And why do you need participation? Well, you need representation so people can have an idea that I too could achieve, but then you have to provide that representation so that they could say, now I could actively contribute because um, you cannot have diversity without having the sense of equity and inclusion or that sense of belonging. So th that is kind of uh, maybe not such a linear pathway, but it is the pathway. And, and, as, and, 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 and so, um, so as, as, we, as we start talking about, you know, what does it take to get there, and General Brito just uh, talked about the Army People's Strategy, which is really a 14-page document that talks about how the Army is going to prioritize people going forward in, in, in four lines of effort, acquire, retain, um, and I just had a, a, a moment where I forgot the, the, those other two. But, but there are also two, two critical enablers, which, is, uh, which includes quality of life. So, so it, it, it forces the army as, a, as an institution to really radically rethink, you know, how we approach talent, because that is what the army people's strategy does. It really provides us a pathway of competing for talent. And, 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 and with that, um, I have been in a lot of other organizations, and it was the notion then was to make sure that we have a strategic approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it was really a standalone document. What we have with the Army People Strategy is an alignment of all these different people, uh, people um, programs and equities in one document, working towards that con concerted end state. And I think you know that provides us that synergy to move forward in in a very coordinated way. 
So as we think about uh, acquisition of people, we focus really um, on, on talent management. And in there um, also allows for choice. So people could choose um, what pathway they want to get to. Uh, not everybody is going to see themselves at a four, as a four-star general or a sergeant major. Um, you know, the same opportunities that are provided within the uniform side are also on the civilian side. So not everybody may see themselves at the top of the at the top of the uh, the pyramid as a senior executive. Some people may see themselves contributing at that mid grade uh, level. However, what we need to ensure is that there is opportunity. And so as we as as we talk about this, it's more of this talent management construct, um, with allowing people to come to the army with the unique unique talents because we we as an army need people to be able to solve these complex problem sets that we face in the world every single day. And, and, and that, that is the beauty of diversity. It's, 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 it's beyond the representation. It's the value that we, we derive in how we innovate and solve complex problem sets to fight and win the nation's wars. And, 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 and that is on the, the military side and, and the civilian, civilian side, because it, it's really one army. Oh, thank you. You know, Brent, and, and Mr. Beach brings up such a great point. Uh, the diversity in thought, the diversity in problem solving, the diversity in seeing things through different lenses that all contribute to the prof to the profession. And even with all of that, you know, as a profession, you know, there's, there's core values, C-O-R-E, core values that are important, um, that it will keep you ahead of any societal issues. And again, I'll go back to that handshake we have with the parents. We want all of that to be part of that culture of trust, which is so, so important. That cohesion amongst teams, that not, whatever your job is, an effort platoon, a cook, a medic, doesn't matter. That cohesion amongst teams of trust that must be there. You know, at some point, we do have a military that, when called upon, needs to be ready to deploy, fight, win, and come back. And all that's embedded with this trust and, and your battle buddy, the leadership, the cohesion within your teams. And it all mixes the nexus for the equity, inclusion, and diversity as well, which is, you know, we're American, period. Well, absolutely, gentlemen, but the, it really is an incredible uh, holistic approach to this to this issue. And you bring up great points that it's not necessarily, uh, you know, someone's gender or, or the, the color of their skin. It's their viewpoint, the fact that we need more diverse viewpoints. I think that's an excellent thing to, to be hitting on right now. Um, so obviously, you know, this is a loaded question because it's literally why our office exists. Um, we are real big proponents, almost some pe people would say zealots of representation. Uh, we've seen through the decades uh, that representation matters to the American public, that when they what they see in entertainment media helps them to better understand. All right. And, and you all have moved beyond representation into participation. The rest of the country is still tackling representation. Um, and this goes back to, you know, there, there's some, some interesting articles that talk about the impact of movies uh, on President Truman's decision to, to lift the ban on, on uh, segregated units and desegre desegregate the military. Uh, movies like Bataan that showed platoons that were integrated with Filipinos and African Americans and Hispanics all in one platoon, which opened a lot of people's eyes that there was value in that diversity. Uh, so, very long way of getting around to it is what would you like the entertainment professionals on this session to do to help you communicate your goals uh, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so, so, so I, I, you know, I, I go back to where I started, right? And, and, and um, you know, we talked about um, th this whole notion of representation, moving into participation. Um, uh, General Brito talked about, you know, this one, the, the, his, uh, the, 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 that uh, officer who was just promoted to, to colonel. So these are, you know, these may sound like very novel stories, but these are stories of, that these stories occur every single day. Um, you, you know, uh, um, th there is, I think in, in terms of the ask, the, the ask goes to really, you know, educate and, 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 and helping to, to widen the aperture on how people understand who 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 we are as your army, uh, I think there's there's a lot of um, misrepresentation in terms of soldiers being uh, being very yes sir no sir being very kind of mechanistic 
uh, and, and soldiers a way that, you know, to understand the lived experiences and the creativity of, of who soldiers are and who army civilians are and, 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 and the plethora of skills that they bring every single day, what they show up with uh, based on the, their, their culture, their, their, their heritage, um, multiculturalism, the different language sets that they bring. All those uh, uh, in essential e ingredients to, to the 21st century army. Uh, I was at I was I was at down at uh, uh, CENTCOM, uh, Central Command and, and uh, Special Operations Command, and they understand the need for people with with different language the skill sets. They understand the need for people to understand different cultures because you know that is crucial to their mission sets. So 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 for me, it really gets back. To, to, to talking about um, the, the, this vastness of the United States Army, the tremendous talent that, that it has, and, and really helping to change some of the mental models out there. So as the, you know, you know, the ability to tell stories. One of the things that we are engaged in right now um, is we are going all across the Army, and we are conducting these uh, listening sessions, Your Voice Matters listening sessions. And, and you might say, well, how did that come about? Well, we know that there were conversations happening, um, you know, at the national level in the aftermath of George Floyd and several other issues that created national civil unrest. So we knew that conversations were happening at the national level. We need to understand what was happening with our soldiers and our civilians. What were their voices? What were their lived experiences in this whole in this in this in this whole experience in this whole experience? You know. Matters of psychological safety. You know, how did they interact with the local community? Um, how did they feel about those those things? Were there some particular incidents that were that were occurring? And, and so we've we've now gone to uh, eleven different installations, uh, conducted about seventy five sessions, engaged over five thousand soldiers and civilians. So helping to to kind of shape some of the narratives that are out there that would help to 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 put the spotlight. You know, on our soldiers and our civilians, and 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 how every day they are making meaningful contributions to this nation, as opposed to uh, as opposed to some of the limitations that may get, you know that would people would say, well, you know, the army is not diverse because it it it, it doesn't have X amount of representation at this level. Well, you know, they, that is one thing, but there's another story be, beyond that, and I think getting to those stories would help to ensure that we are doing, uh, you know, the true service for the American people by, 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 by ensuring that those stories that are not normally told are told. Yeah, you know, Brett, that, that's actually a very good question. I think just being teammates with organizations like yourself to, to help tell the story, will every story be positive? Of course not. I mean, this is life. Um, but well, there's a lot of a lot of greatness going on, and, and just sharing those opportunities with the with the industry uh, would help to tell that story. And we need to we need to when I say we the enterprise and all the services probably, you know, could do some uh, continued partnership on those great opportunities, and and perhaps pick a story like the example I gave you in the beginning, or you might go down to XX camp and say, gee, who's a distinguished honor of the guy of this this school? You might just be surprised. It's we might not expect. Uh, if you look back to 50 years of cultural norms, which have been broken, uh, mm -hmm. when a soldier who decides to serve has the potential, can meet the standard and reach their full full goals. Uh, so I think there's a, a partnership we can assist with that as well. No, I agree, sir. And I, I think I relate a, an anecdote to you all that I won't give away details on who it was, but you know there large studio was asking us the exact same questions. You know, we want to feature a unit, but we want to make sure that the unit is diverse. And we had a back and forth conversation and we were both on the same page. I mean, there, there is an intense focus in, from, from our viewpoint, working with studios and production companies that they have the same goals. They, they want to tell an army story that is an American story and an American story is diverse. Um, so speaking of stories, we did have one question uh, asking about the, the types of stories you're talking about. Uh, is there somewhere they, that entertainment professionals can go to to find inspiration with vignettes like what you're just you were describing in the beginning? Yeah, I, I, you could 
probably grab, grab any old guy like myself that can tell one. <laughs> uh, but definitely we can work through our, through our respective uh, public affairs channels to tell that. And, and within each, well, heck, there's a lot of military installations out there, of course, to include, I've been stationed at one out on the West Coast that would probably be chomping at the bit to, to share something that's going great on their installation. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's just a training vignette, a, vi a, a video, or let me highlight the, the greatness of this soldier. Um, I was at an installation, I'll just, I'll leave it unnamed, uh, a couple of days ago, and talked to a, a sergeant first class, to happen to be female sergeant first class, who was in the, in the public affairs officer a, a field, as a matter of fact. Had not, she was driving a van, but had nothing to do with public affairs, but that just happened to be her specialty. And just so happened that her dad's birthday was the next day. Coincidentally, her dad's birthday, this is a true story, her dad's birthday was the same day as my birthday. Ah. So let's call your dad. She didn't believe it. So we went on FaceTime and called her dad, who happened to be a veteran. He served 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, to see the smile on his face to say, you wouldn't believe how great of a job your daughter's doing. Just tell him the story. Uh, and, and those are those are feel good opportunities. It, it made I felt great about it. Just seeing her dad smile, and he was up in the farm driving his tractor. I'm not telling the story. This is true uh, <laughs> on, on Facetime, but that connects to the to the opening remarks and, and to your question. You have to have a nexus. My thoughts mm -hmm. with the military and the community, the military and the public. Um, you know, Brad, a little factoid, there's 135,000 soldiers join the Army every year. Just, just enlisted soldiers. I think it's about 6,000 officers. So just, just think of the representation you have coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. That nexus is so key. And to bring it back to your question, I, I, I just think sharing those opportunities, I'm probably, probably over-enthusiastic <laughs> with, with <laughs> it, but just would really allow us to continue to want those 135 soldiers to join every year. No, sir. I mean, you're sitting there telling that vignette. I know there's a writer like taking notes right now. I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm gonna. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so, I mean, if, if I could just push on that, you know, a, a little bit because I, I think there's uh, inspiration uh, every single uh, day across the army, and 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 um, it may be a little bit difficult to catalog some of those. I, I would tell you that I, I personally, um, uh, in 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 my backpack, I, I have. Um, you know, I have a program from a funeral of, of, of a soldier who was, uh, who, who I became a very good friend with. Um, it, you know, we did not start out very, as very good friends. I, you know, I, I, you know, this was, I was, I was in Germany getting ready to deploy and, um, and, and this guy came to be a part of my, of, of my platoon. And, uh, there was just something about him that I just didn't like. I, I don't know why. Um, but I got to know him. And then we got to be very, very good friends. And on the on my on, on a few years ago, on my son's birthday, um, I got a call from his wife that he died. And, and, and so, you know, and, and she was like, but they treated him very good. And the they that she was referring to was the people at a VA hospital. And so um, so so I was listed as a as an honorary pallbearer. But, but I keep that with me every single day because it's a reminder to me that I'm not serve. this is not a self-serving job. There is somebody else and I need to be, I need to make sure that my service as a public servant is of that level where somebody else could have that experience where they could say, but they treated him or her very good. And I think that really is the essence of what we do uh, in the army. We serve because we there is something much bigger than than, 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 than than the individual person. And, and, I, and I keep that program because there are times when things could get pretty rough and we've got to be reminded of why we serve. And so I don't know every honorable thing uh, why I serve, but I, I, I have an allegiance to my friend Gary who served and went on before me. And, and that is one of the things that, that kind of keeps me grounded. But as I think about that, there are many, many stories across the Army where we have people performing selflessly. I mean, we see it in our Medal of, of, of Honor recipients, and those are some of the stories. There are people who support them in what they do. 
and, and, and so, and so, and it, it becomes kind of hard to catalog because you know, with a, with, with an army of almost a million uh, people, th there are probably a million stories out there. Oh, no doubt, sir. Uh, I mean, what you're hitting on it, the stories of service, I think they resonate with the with the American public. Um, you know, we, we've all been thanked for our service, and, and one of the things that we certainly focus on in our job well, but with, but with who? Sure that when going to do it? You uh, thank us for this, for our service that you better understand it, and I think that's where the entertainment industry can certainly help us to communicate what our service is. It's not all Medal of Honor recipients, just someone who comes in for four years and serves at a couple of duty stations. You know, that is service, and it's honorable service. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Um, one was uh, asking about the DOD outsourcing entertainment needs, and I say that you, you can talk to our office. Uh, you know, there are opportunities for organizations to work directly with entertainment uh, uh, companies to to tell the Army story. So um, please communicate to us directly if you'd like, um, and we can we can connect you with that. We had a second question uh, that says, "What is then the one we, thing?" That I mean, but then what do we do? Can I mean, bring what back five people this, join, this or no I mean, one joins, or I mean, it's kind of, you know what I mean, like equity, that yeah. those uh, civilians could be doing. Hey, Breda, I'm sorry. Uh, somebody, yeah, somebody. somebody I think we had somebody on mute. Yeah. So uh, they, what she's asking is, what's the one thing that civilians can take back to their organizations that the Army does in relation to diversity, equity, inclusion? Obviously, the Army's not like, you know, Amazon or McDonald's or, you know, it's a different type of organization. But where are the parallels that the Army could help a civilian organization to better understand how they can include, be more inclusive and diverse? Okay. So, so um, one of the big differences between uh, federal agencies and uh, private sector is that in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the federal agencies, every year we are required to report um, how, you know, our representation. So it, it, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission requires us to provide that representation. Uh, and uh, what we do, so how do we know if we are well represented or not? So there are different uh, occupation fields and each occupation field, um, you know, has an index that is calculated by the Department of Labor. So we look and, and we say, how do we compare to the civilian labor force? And so that is one of the things that we do in terms of, uh, of the representation factor. But, you know, as we move from representation to participation, there are ways that we, that we look at how we deliberately develop people for the, for the 21st century workforce. So the, uh, you, you come in to the government, and as you understand how to work within the federal government, between the different occupational fields, you know, there's a deliberate way of developing people to get to the next level. So uh, unlike, the, unlike uh, the private sector, um, we sometimes just don't go and hire somebody. There's a methodology within the workforce that we provide a structured developmental approach um, because, it, again, it's one of the ways that we retain talent. Um, so the other thing that we do then, uh, in the private sector, they call them, uh, employee, uh, resource groups. So we have, uh, some, uh, some, some mix of, 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 of that. Um, um, but each person is, is also, um, um, civilian on the civilian side could also follow a path called the, uh, the individual development plan. And so that is where they could say, this is what I want to do um, for the, in, my, in my federal career. And, and, and so it, it provides them the option of, of mapping out what that career path would look like for them, discussing that with their supervisor, and then working through um, that. And, 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 and so just, just, just enabling somebody, empowering people to define what their growth path would look like through, through that uh, individual uh, development plan. And the other thing is is, is um, the use of develop, developmental assignment uh, assignments and having people you know you may be hired to to do budgets but you may have interest in human capital and and how do we allow for them to have a developmental rotation again because as they grow and and they, they attain more skills and talents then the better the army becomes. And Brent, if I may add just yes, just sir. this point. 
and a little, a little less formal, but we we know we recognize the value and importance of mentorship and coaching at all ranks and all specialties. And, and you know how you how that'll help that I'll just say the, the private first class or the second lieutenant become the captain, the major, the colonel, the sergeant, the sergeant first class, the sergeant major. And that's embedded with leadership that we owe the ranks to come up to ensure that we have that lifelong learning and continuity in, in the in the serve in the ranks. And also tied to the strategy we mentioned up front, taking the time now to look at our promotion cycles and assignment cycles and develop, continue to polish the 21st century talent management process that's ongoing to ensure that we give the best to that talent. And if there's any, any obstacles that's in way, get rid of the obstacle to allow mm -hmm. that soldier to reach his or her potential, allow us to compete for the talent and retain the talent. You know, sir, I mean, I'm sitting here listening to you both talk about this and the word that keeps coming to mind is diligence. Like this is not, there's not gonna be a ticker tape parade where we celebrate the fact that we ended prejudice and racism. Like we're not gonna high five and say we've, we're, we've done it. Uh, it. It's an ongoing process in order to change culture over time. The culture of the army in 1985 is certainly not the culture that it is today but not because of some single event that caused everybody to, to turn on a switch, right? It's these, this layered approach that you're describing from the squad level all the way up to the highest levels of the Army uh, that inculcates that in our Army culture, that we, you know, our diversity is our strength, that you know, we need to identify bias um, and, and understand it. Um, and one of the, the, the really intriguing programs that you all uh, are managing now is the Talent Management Task Force with the assessment program. And I think, to me, that is a really interesting thing that the entertainment industry could learn more about uh, with the battalion commander assessment program, brigade commander, and the sergeant major uh, program. If you could sort of briefly talk about what is the end state with those assessment programs that, that go beyond issues of, of just racism, but also just overall inherent bias that we that we have. Yes, well, I will tell you that that one falls clearly in my, my rucksack or my lane as the, the G1 for the Army, and we have a very talented team of military and civilian that, that run that. But to give you the, the bluff or the broad, broad summary on the assessment programs, and I, I'll say relatively new, but it's been about 18 months, almost about two years now since the first pilot. If you, if you were to say, what's the end state? And that's to ensure that the best commander for battalion or brigade and the best sergeant major, best senior leader to stand in front of any formation and ensure he or she gives the best leadership of dignity, respect, cohesion, culture, and trust to those soldiers standing in front of him. Now, I say that broadly, but with that, what the assessment program has allowed us to do to include receiving some tier and subordinate feedback from previous assignments, but also assessing the leadership capabilities and or gaps in that leader before they're deemed fit to lead soldiers. So even if it eliminates one or two or a couple or a handful that may show toxic tendencies or counterproductive tendencies, it's good. If we identify one that might not be totally promoted promoting an environment that doesn't tolerate harassment, sexual harassment, assault, the equal opportunity issues. Good. That's what this assessment program does for us. So if you put yourself, I'm one of those, I'll just say 700 soldiers standing in a battalion, you want to have that level of trust in the commander standing in front of you. And our commander's assessment program, coupled with other talent management programs, ongoing, not only for the officers, but the NC non-commissioned officers as well, is allowing us to deliver the best leader that our soldiers simply deserve. Can, 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 I think it's it's a very innovative program, sir. I mean, is there is there ever any talk of having a crosstalk with corporations? Uh, because toxic leadership is not an army thing. It's sure. it's across the board. There, you can have, like you said, counterproductive or toxic leadership in any organization. Sure, Brett, I, I would tell you, and, and, and I will go back to the team so that we, we do that. But I can also say, when a lot of these programs were being developed 
I'll take it back 18, 12, 18 months ago, we learned a lot from talking to industry mm -hmm. um, and how you, how you do it. Industry that made up, uh, had a 20, 20th and 21st century focused management program balanced it. We looked at it in the lens of we have an industrial age one that needed to be improved. Uh, but I'll take that as a challenge where uh, you know, what can we infuse to the community? Because at the end of the day, we're helping each other. Uh, we represent America, but uh, something that can be done. But we definitely learn from studying ourselves, studying others that have been successful like that. You know, if I could just add that, you know, um, this uh, this this whole integrated approach, I think, is 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 um, is, is quite desirable. Um, we know that people are complex, and so we haven't found the, the, that one silver bullet to people issues across society because it because of the complexity of it. So being able to really, um, uh, uh, you know, help create some new mental models. And, and the understanding that this is, 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 would continue to be a very iterative process because what we learn now and, and what, we, what we implement now um, is, is good for, there's a time frame that, that's, that, that, that there's a shelf life to it. And so we need to, to constantly be in that iterative process to ensure that we are driving to new end states. Um, I mean, right now we are um, you know, talking to each other on a screen and we are talking to each other on a screen uh, because we are in a COVID environment. And, and so, you know, what does leadership look like? What, what are new practices necessary? I think those are all the areas that we could all learn from and grow from and, and share some of, uh, some of the lessons learned um, as, as we migrate to new, new processes. We, we implement new culture change uh, uh, actions. We, 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 we develop new organizational models. I, I think, you know, as a society, we are all simply trying to understand this whole new world of technology, integration of people, smart machines into, uh, into, into people teams. So, so there's a lot that we could uh, all learn from as we go through all these changes together. No, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so I put up your slide, hopefully you can see this, uh, just because we're, we're starting to run low on time. Just if there was anything you wanted to highlight on your slide, can, hopefully you can see that. Sure, I, I can. If, if, if I think we throughout the discussion, Brett, and, and okay. not only from the questions but the dialogue, have, have shown that from its inception, the, the, the Army's been very focused on doing what's right for those who decide to serve. Mm -hmm. And leaders have made tough to, tough decisions to ensure we have that level of environment. So if we you know, where we're at now is you go to that lower quad of where the Army is today. What can we do today that's going to make tomorrow even better mm -hmm. uh, for those who, who want to join? So a continual look from through the entire life cycle, like giving that high school student or a college student an opportunity and when they get in and, and, and helping them through the ranks yeah. with an eye and always being combat ready. And I mm -hmm. would extend the same level of just caring for our civilians as well, because it's, it's a, definitely a team and you're not, you're not going to make it without the other. But Clearly, just just the value of the, the diversity, equity, inclusion, not only as a math problem, don't look at it that way. You know, it's it's getting the best out of the talent and, and those who just decide to serve. And you, and you mentioned, you might want to do two years and get out. That's fine. We'll give you some opportunities while you're in to get out a better person. You might want to do 20. We'll give you some opportunities to be the better person through that as well. Yeah. So, so um, uh, General Brito, I, I just really want to underscore something you just said because I think it's it's really powerful, and I think that this is also something that um, that the uh, that the industry needs to understand. Um, you know, this is really um, it's beyond the right thing to do. It's kind of like the moral thing to do for our, our for for the survival of our society. I think there's a lot of times we, we look at this uh, these uh, the, the the notion of diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, as, as these numbers. And, and in some instances, I know like in, in some industry, they talk about the business case for diversity. I think we need a new mental model and we kind of need to rethink. Uh, there's no business case for diversity. You know, there's an optimization of talent that comes when you have a diverse workforce. And so if, if you're trying to justify diversity, equity, inclusion from a business model lens, I think that's the wrong model. And, and so for us, it becomes, a, you know, 
um, beyond the right thing. It becomes a moral imperative. It becomes a, the notion that we have a combat-ready army because we've got the best people from all across these uh, United States. No, I, I agree, and I think you know everything that you're you're saying is right on point. I mean, it, our diversity is our strength, and it's not uh, it's not necessarily only the business model. It's that it's the right thing to do. And uh, for this, I would, I'd like to close out with the, the late Senator McCain. Actually, about three years ago, spoke on this. He said that. Uh, we should all be guided by the principle that any American who wants to serve our country and is able to meet the standards should have the opportunity to do so and should be treated as the patriot that they are. And I think what you gentlemen have been talking about today encapsulates all of that. And so I wanted to thank you for that. Well, Brett, thank you for the opportunity and for all those supporting today. Again, uh, thank you for, your, for supporting us. And I'm looking forward to continued relationship. Thank you so much. No, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and, and with the last couple of minutes we have, I, I'd love to talk about the next uh, Joe Talks. We're really very excited about it because I think this is a perfect example of how the Army and, and the civilian sector can cooperate. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, the best-selling author, Max Brooks, uh, most well-known for World War Z. Uh, which was a, uh, a 2013 uh, hit movie by Brad Pitt as well, uh, combined with uh, with a writing partner, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Cavanaugh, who is an Army strategist, uh, currently a strategic planner at NORAD. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the West Point Modern War Institute. Um, he's one of our big heads, right, that we love to talk about in the Army. Well, they have written, co-written and co-edited two books on strategy and how Hollywood helps us to better understand future warfare, future conflict, um, and then conversely, how the Army helps uh, entertainment industry professionals to better understand how they need to represent uh, future conflict uh, and breaking out of the mold, like you talked about, sir, of, um, of traditional thinking, uh, They, you know, talking about adversity and mental agility and, and flexibility. So. Uh, that's going to be March 24th, uh, same time, uh, 1, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, and we will be sending out a notice for that. So uh, everyone look forward to that. Uh, once again, uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been very enlightening, I think, for everybody. Uh, we had a few questions we didn't get to, unfortunately, but uh, please uh, come on board and, and ask us. Uh, you can send us a note if you want us to answer uh, any of your questions. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody for participating in, in our second Joe Talks. And thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. It. Okay.